Hey, good morning, Harbor Church. Uh, Pastor Josh here. I'm coming to you via video because I wanted to make sure that I got to say this to each service today. Um, one, thanks for coming. Thanks for being a part of what, what God's doing here at Harbor Church. But two, I've got a special request for you. Um, I want you to be in extra prayer this week. As many of you know, those of you that have been coming to Harbor for a while, we've been growing. God keeps blessing and blessing us, and we are so thankful for that. And as more people come, uh, more people are finding and following Jesus. We love that. And we're, we've wondered how would God continue to allow us to grow, or should we add another service? How, how should we do this? And God has created a couple opportunities for us, and we are actively right now praying if this would be God's will to allow us to step forward into some new territory. I've been encouraging you in the last few months just to, to seek God. I'm going to ask you specifically this week as your pastor, would you take some time and pray and fast that God would make it very clear to us, very evident to us uh, what his will would be for us as a church to do, that he would open the doors that he wants us to walk through and close the doors that he doesn't want us to walk through uh, because we need to we need to know what it is that we should do to keep reaching more and more people with Jesus. Many of our neighbors, our family members, people all around our communities need access to the, the gospel message of Jesus. And I believe God might be opening a door for Harbor to be able to do this on a greater level. But it's going to require a lot of faith, and it's definitely going to require him to, to lead the way. So what I'm asking you as your pastor, join me this week in praying and praying. Maybe it's fasting and praying. Maybe it's it's extra extra time at lunch or in the morning or the evening. But let's ask God to show up in a big way and make it very clear how He would have His church move forward. Will you join me in praying? Let's let's pray before we jump into the service. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you. We thank you so much for all that you've given us. God, you are so good and you've blessed us so much. Lord, there's things we don't understand. There's things that that obviously are yet to be revealed to us. But Lord. We trust you. God, we thank you for the way you've uh, you've interacted in our church and in our communities. God, we thank you for the lives that are being changed. And yet, God, we, we, come, we come before you and we ask that you would continue to bless. God, that you would continue to pull people to you. Lord, there's marriages that are still struggling. There's addictions that are still powerful in people's lives. God, there's so many people that still are far from Jesus and desperately need to know him. So, Lord, we're asking that you would help us know how we can stay in the fight, how you would have us fight on a greater level for, for the kingdom, how we can be better testimonies. God, please use us in, in a powerful, powerful way and make it very clear to us how you would have us go forward. We ask this, we pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. guys, welcome back. We're excited to uh, have you joining us for another message. And this week we have a special guest speaker. Uh, instead of bringing you the word, I've invited my good friend, Blake Hunter, who is one of our missionaries to South Africa, if he would come and deliver the word this week. So Blake, man, thanks for, thanks for coming. Thanks for yeah, being a part of it. Thanks, Josh. I'm so excited to be here and to be able to share with everybody what God's been doing in Cape Town and just to be able to uh, challenge you guys in this really exciting series that, that uh, you guys are in right now. So we're in Unstoppable, and that's been a series on the armor of God. And the big idea is that God's put us in a battlefield, a spiritual battlefield. And not only are we going to battle every day in this spiritual world, but he's also equipped us. He's called us to walk with him, and he's equipped us to fight back and also to be a witness to our friends, to our families, to the people around us. Yeah. Yeah, this message is, is, is so powerful to talk about how an encounter with Jesus can transform us and empower us to be able to handle that spiritual battle that we face in, in the world around us. So this week, tune in to hear Blake tell us how we can be unstoppable on the army of God. So watch this. Yeah, thanks everybody. It's so exciting to be here this weekend. And um, yeah, I just want to say, first of all, uh, just a big thank you to Harbor. 
Um, as Josh said, uh, it was like seven or eight years ago that we were here on the Cape, and we were here in the very early stages of Harbor, kind of starting out, and, and it was like in your living room, and then going out from there, and as we would leave and come back every year or two, it was just so crazy to see Harbor exploding. Every time we came back, you were in a new venue, you were in a new location, and Pastor Josh has been the biggest encouragement in my life since the day that I met him, and I know that you know how great he is, but I want you to know from someone outside of your church what an encouragement and a blessing and, a, and just a great friend that he has been to me over the years. And we got to play golf today. I won't tell you who won, but you can ask him later. But we got to play, we got to play golf today. And um, he has just been such an encouragement in my life and my wife's uh, life. And whenever we moved four years ago to Cape Town, uh, Josh and Kaylee helped us move. So he and, he and his wife, Kaylee, was a very busy time in Harbor's uh, life and they dropped everything and they came and uh, spent about two weeks with us just kind of helping us move. We had a six month old and a two year old and they helped with the babies on the plane and all the luggage. And uh, I'm just so thankful for his investment in my life and uh, Harbor's investment in my life. So thank you all so much for that. And uh, it's, it's just so awesome to be here this weekend. Uh, we are continuing this discussion on spiritual warfare. And I wanna remind us a few things. First of all, this is happening to all of us. Right, So whether you consider yourself a Christian or a believer or whatever the word is that we use sometimes, or you don't consider yourself that, spiritual warfare is happening to all of us. Okay, The Bible says that, the, that, that Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Yeah. So there's a battle going on for your soul right now. And that's why it's so important that we talk about these things. We're, we're talking about the armor so that we can protect ourselves. We can prepare ourselves for this battle. And a few weeks ago, we talked about the belt of truth, right? The belt of truth is what everything kind of tucks into. Without that belt of truth, everything falls apart. Now, in today's world, every year or six months or three months, truth seems to change, doesn't it? <laughs> It's like all the time, there's a different thing we have to believe in or support or not support, and everything is changing all of the time. But as believers, what do we keep going back to for our truth? Is It's right here, right? And truth doesn't change. So we go back to this. And as we're looking at what do we build our defense on for this spiritual warfare, I just want to remind us that it's truth. I want to look at this passage in 2 Corinthians. It's, it's really important for understanding the difference from before we, we were believers to now being believers. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you want to turn there with me. We're going to have it up here on the screen as well. Second Corinthians chapter 5, it says this, uh, starting in verse 14. It says, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. See, there's, this is the part of, of, of transformation. When you put your faith in Christ for salvation, when you become a believer or a Christian, and we use all these different terms, and we're not talking about uh, if you were baptized, you know, what makes you Christian is not being baptized into a church or signing a church covenant or becoming a member of a church. Becoming a Christian is putting your faith and trust and hope in Jesus Christ for eternal life, understanding that we have separated ourselves from our creator because of our sin. Jesus was perfect for us. He lived a perfect life, died on the cross in our place. And we trust in that for salvation. And if you've done that, you are a believer. And it says here, the old life is, is, is old, is gone. We don't live that way anymore. And not only do we live a different way, it says that we have stopped evaluating, in verse 16, we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, but how differently we know him now. So we don't only live differently, but we actually view other people differently. We understand that we're not just physical beings that are living and then dying and that's it, but there's the spiritual aspect of us that lives forever and we view people this way. It says in verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has come. All this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So there's the message of the gospel right there. 
that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and no longer counting our sin against us. In verse 20, it says, now we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Father, we uh, come before you uh, this weekend and we, we praise you. We praise you for who you are, for what you've done for us. And as we open your word and as we read and as we have this encounter, uh, we aren't just reading a, a book that has no significance. We're not just reading a book that's just like any other book. We are reading a document that you have preserved for us for thousands of years and you are alive and active and we're asking you, God, today that you would speak to us through your written word that this would be an exchange between us and you where we would be open to what you have for us today, that we would be transformed by your word and that we would be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus. And we ask all this in your name, amen. So there's this idea of transformation. There's this idea of we are in spiritual warfare, whether you're a believer or not, and that being exposed to truth causes transformation. I want to look in John chapter four. There's this amazing story of this encounter with Jesus where we see a woman who is going through some very serious spiritual warfare, and we see how she comes through this. And I want to share this story with you. It's in John chapter four, if you want to turn there with me. And starting in verse one, it says, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, talking about John the Baptist. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and he returned to Galilee and he had to go through Samaria on the way. Now, a couple of things here. Judea was like the, the headquarters of the Jewish religion. And Jesus is the Messiah. Sometimes we think about Jesus as kind of like, you know, Christian, and then there's the Jewish faith, and those two things don't really mix. But remember, Jesus is Jewish. And Jesus, in fact, is kind of the culmination of the whole Jewish religion. So if he should have been accepted anywhere, it should have been Judea. But yet he's here and all of those Jewish leaders are kind of driving him out. And so it says he's going to go to Galilee and it says that he had to go through Samaria. Now, if you know anything about uh, th that, that, that area of the world during this time, Jews and Samaritans hated each other. And in order to go from one place to another, a Jewish person would never go through Samaria. Even though it might be the quickest geographically, they would go all the way around Samaria to go to Galilee. Now, this is because the roads were better. The people were more friendly. If you had to stop for the night, you were with your Jewish countrymen and they would accept you. You would never be caught dead going through Samaria. So when it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria, we're not talking about geography. This is the savior of the world realizing that there is somebody in need of saving and he has to go through Samaria. In verse five, it says, eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus tired from the long walk sat wearily beside the well about noontime. I love that we see Jesus in a vulnerable state here. Right? We know that Jesus is, 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 is God. We know that he's also 100% man. But here we see him in a vulnerable state. How many of you, when you're really tired and hot and thirsty, want to talk to anybody? None of us do, right? But Jesus is here and his human side is hot, tired, and thirsty. But he knows that in the midst of his struggle, in the midst of this vulnerability, he's going to be able to minister to someone. And he doesn't miss an opportunity. It says in verse seven, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. We're gonna find out here in a couple of minutes that this Samaritan woman was really kind of the scorn of the town. Nobody wanted to spend any time with her. Uh, she's, she's really very, actually a very promiscuous woman. She had slept around a lot. She'd been had a lot of men that she had lived with, a lot of different husbands. And so obviously, especially during that time, nobody wanted to spend any time around her. Nobody wanted to be associated with her. And obviously none of the women wanted their husbands around her. And so she's going in the middle of the day in the hottest part of the day to, to go and draw water, which is not normal. So that she can be alone. So imagine this woman who has no friends in town, nobody wants to spend any time with her, and she's going through the spiritual warfare of wondering, what's my life even worth anymore? 
And as she's walking to the well to go draw water, she sees someone sitting there and she's probably thinking, oh, great, here we go. You know, I'm gonna have to talk to this person or hopefully they don't, they don't interact with me. But she notices that he's Jewish and she knows that Jewish, especially men don't ever really talk to women in public, but especially a Jewish man. But Jesus jumps in right away and he asks her for a drink. In verse nine, it says, the woman was surprised for Jews refuse to have anything to do with Samaritans. So she says to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? A lot of scholars think that this was kind of like a stab at Jesus. Like, really? You want nothing to do with us, but now that you're thirsty and you have no way to draw water, now you need us, right? That's that's what's going on here. In verse 10, Jesus responds to her, if you only knew the gift that God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. She says, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think that you're greater than our ancestor Jacob? So Samaritans believe that they were also equal uh, descendants of Jacob and Jews didn't believe that. So she's throwing it right back at him again. Our shared ancestor Jacob, who makes me just as valuable as you, dug this well. Are you saying that you're better than him? She, uh, She says, how can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? In verse 13, Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. She says, please, sir, give me this water. I'm, I'm coming here every day. I'm having to carry this pot of water back. I'm having to come in the middle of the day. If I don't come in the middle of the day, I'm being mocked and ridiculed by everybody else. You're telling me that you have a solution to all of my problems and I could never leave my house again? Please give me this. She says, then I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come here to get water. So Jesus does what's culturally appropriate here. And he says, go and, go and get your husband. If we're going to keep talking here in public, it's, it's, it's proper for you to have your husband here. And she says, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, you're right. You don't have a husband for you've had five husbands and you, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You've spoken the truth. He starts to touch a little nerve here and she wants to change the subject. Sir, you must be a prophet. So, so tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it's here? So she's bringing up this debate that Jews and Samaritans have had for a long, long time. Moses, when he first came into the promised land, he actually divided the tribes. And he said, half of you will worship at Mount Ebal, half at Mount Gerizim. And so Samaritans say, we can worship here. Then of course, Solomon builds that temple in Jerusalem. And they say the Jews must worship there now. And it's this whole big, long debate. And Jesus isn't going to be drawn into this whole argument here, but he also knows that Samaritans aren't just worshiping God there. They're actually bringing in all of the idols and all of the false worship that their surrounding neighbors are worshiping. And so Jesus knows that she's bringing this up to change the subject, and I'm not going to fall for this. In verse 23, she says, the time is coming. Oh, sorry. Let's go back to verse 21. Jesus says, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. He's saying, you guys are mixing in all kinds of false gods and false ideas and false beliefs. And he says, uh, after that, he says, while we Jews know all about him for salvation comes through the Jews. The Jews were the ones that were entrusted with the message. And of course, Jesus himself was Jewish. But then he says in verse 23, the time is coming. Indeed, it's now here. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, and in truth. All this debate, all these arguments, all of these things actually don't matter. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that, that, that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So what he's talking about here, first of all, he says in spirit, which means where you are. We are all spiritual. We all have a spirit. We can worship God where we are. And then he says in truth. What does that mean? What is, how do we worship God in truth? This is Worshiping God authentically, without pretension, without hiding. How many of you have been to a church where you felt like everybody was playing pretend about how godly and good they were? That's what he's talking about. We worship God in spirit and in truth. And Jesus just dropped a little truth bomb on her earlier about her husband's. 
And she's sitting there thinking like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm confused. You're probably confused tonight. And so he's, he's having this whole conversation here. And in verse 25, the woman says, I know the Messiah is coming. The one who was called Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. She's like, man, like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know why you brought up my husband's. I don't know why you, why we're having this debate about where to worship, but I know that one day the Messiah is coming and he's going to fix all of this. He's going to fix where we worship. He's going to fix my problems with my village. He's going to fix my problems with all my husbands and my ex-husbands. He's going to fix all of the issues, all of the strife, all of the shame, all of the embarrassment, everything that I'm going through. This Messiah is going to fix all of these things. And Jesus looks at her in verse 26 and he says, I am the Messiah. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Can you imagine sitting there and thinking like, whoa, whoa, like, like, really? And look in verse 27. It says, his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? So the woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone. Then she said, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. This, this last paragraph to me, there's a couple of things that I think are so important for us to understand as we look at our own life, at spiritual warfare, at an encounter with Jesus. The first one is in verse 28, it says that the woman left her water jar beside the well. The whole reason that she was there was to get water and she would still need it that day. But she didn't do the most efficient thing and, and take the water back home on her way. She, she left it. The message that she had to share was more important than, than getting water for her household that day. The next thing here, it really, I mean, I've, I've read this passage so many times and, and just, just a couple of weeks ago, this, this hit me so hard. Look at verse 29. Look at what she, her message to the village is. Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he be the Messiah? So she goes to the town square where everyone knows her. Everyone looks down at her. Everyone mocks her and ridicules her because of her past. And she goes and tells them, come and see a man that told me everything I ever did. And, and everyone was probably like, Are, you're proud of this? <laughs> Like, you're cool with that? Like, one more guy knows, like, your whole story? Like, seriously? And she had probably had to keep telling them over and over and over again. And the message was, come and see, come and see, come and see. This man knows everything about me. And the message wasn't just, hey, you know all my problems and he does too. The message was, here is a man that knows all of my shame, all of my embarrassment, all of my guilt, and he accepts me. Yeah. And I want that for you. Good. I want that for you. I bet it was embarrassing to go back. The town didn't like her. She could have moved somewhere else and had a fresh start. But she goes back to the town and she shares with everybody, here is a man that knows me and I want you to know him too. And I think about how we interact with people we don't want everyone to know our past. We're cool with like, you know, hey, take Jesus and, you know, yeah, I have some problems and I'm better now. And sometimes we find like that one pet sin that we're like, it's like kind of edgy. So we're kind of cool talking about it. Yeah, I, you know, I used to get in trouble with the law and now I'm like pretty good. But it's like this woman went to the people that hated her and she probably hated them. And she said, come and see a man who told me everything. But where did that start? Where did, where did this whole thing start for this woman? It started at sitting at the well with Jesus. That, that transformation that changed her from a woman who was full of shame to a woman that had met the Messiah to a woman that had gone back to her town and been reconciled to the whole town, it started with sitting at the well with Jesus. So, so like, what does that mean for us today? 
How can we sit at the well with Jesus? It's here. It's sitting, being exposed to truth, allowing truth to come into our into our minds and 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 come into our hearts and change our thinking, change how we live, change how we act, change how we think. You want to be prepared for spiritual warfare against a lion who was seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. You got to sit at the well with Jesus. And it's, it, it scares me how much of the Christian life we can do without sitting at the well with Jesus. Like when was the last time you were like alone at home and just read his word and allowed it to speak to you? It's scary how much of my job as a church planter and as a pastor, you know, I can run a service, I can start a community group, I can run a youth event. There's a lot of things I can pull off without sitting at the well with Jesus. And that's dangerous. And that's when Satan can come in. That's when there's a hole in the armor. You know, we, we talk about all the different pieces of armor. And if you were like an actual warrior going out to battle and you were missing a piece of armor, it would be pretty obvious. But this spiritual warfare that we don't see on the outside, half the time we walk out into spiritual battle, we're not fully dressed. And it's not more church, more church is great. It's not more money, more giving more money to church is great. It's not more programs. It's not doing all of those things. All of those things are great. It's more Jesus. It's more truth. It's allowing Jesus to move in and to have his way with our life, to change whatever he wants. You know, and, and you might be here this, this weekend and you might be someone that thinks like, I'm not a Christian, I'm not a believer, I'm not any of those things. I want to challenge you. Just sit at the well with Jesus and investigate. This woman didn't believe in him. This woman, it sounds like, kind of hated him at the beginning. But she sat and she listened and she engaged him. And she left transformed. The old life was gone. This new life came. If you haven't made that decision, just sit with him and, 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 and read and ask him to speak to you. We don't just get up here and say these things because it's cool to do it and it's like builds a big crowd and all those things. We do it because we've experienced it. We have felt it. We've We've stood in front of people to preach and known that I have struggles today and I have struggles tomorrow. And I'm not standing here to tell you about Jesus because I've got it all figured out. I'm here to tell you because he's good and because he knows me and he knows that I'm weak. He knows that I face this battle unprepared all the time, but he'll use me if we're willing. Now, if you are a believer and, and you're trying to figure out this whole process of how, how do I go out prepared and how do I allow truth to speak to me? First of all, the more you can be in this, the stronger you can be. But second of all, I want to share with you something that a pastor friend of mine used to say. He said, a lot of times when people come over to our house, we say, hey, make yourself at home. And what does that really mean? It means like, come in, feed up on the couch, but like, that's it, right? <laughs> If it's like the first time and we're like, make yourself at home when they open up the fridge, you're like, whoa, all right, cool. If you say, make yourself at home and they start moving furniture around, you're like, dude, who is this guy? Like, and then you got to figure out when do you send them out? But what if you say, make yourself at home and they're like, oh, cool. They go back out to the truck. They bring in a bucket of paint. They start painting walls. They start moving furniture. They start changing everything in the whole layout of the house. And I think sometimes we tell Jesus, make yourself at home, and we don't mean it. It's like, yeah, put your feet up. Okay, I'll go to church. Okay, I'll give some more money. 
but I don't want to change like how I think. I don't want to change how I live. I don't want to change. Like, what if my friends make fun of me? This woman didn't care anymore. Not because she was perfect, because she met with Jesus. We have to keep going back. We have to keep going back. We talk about the four T's a lot here at Harbor. And it's about giving God your time, your talent, your treasure, and your testimony. This woman had, she had time, but she didn't have much talent. She didn't have much treasure, but she had her story. Yeah. Oh, good. And the story wasn't, I was bad, but look how good I am now. She was still pretty messed up. She still had five ex-husbands and she was still living with the guy she wasn't married to. And she had all kinds of problems, but she shared the story of Jesus. Yeah. That's what our testimony is. And we can share that. Later on, um, in John chapter 4, 39 to 42, verse 39, it says, Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. Look at the irony where he should have been accepted, they kicked him out. And with his enemies here, they begged him to stay. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Would you let God use your testimony? I like that many more believed. Many more believed. That's what we want for Cape Cod, isn't it? That's what, what I want for Cape Town. That's what we want. And as we go out and as we face spiritual warfare, we can't do it without this. We can't do it without Jesus. We can't do it without sitting at the well. So my challenge is this week, this weekend, today, get alone with Jesus. And let him transform you. Would you stand with me? Father, we, we, we come before you this weekend and we think about the ways in our life that we don't want you to change, that we don't want you to adjust. We think about the things that we hold back from you. And God, I pray that we would be transformed by encountering you that we would remind ourselves that church is great, small groups are great, community outreach is great, but we need to encounter Jesus. And God, I pray that tonight, if, if there's someone here that hasn't put their faith in you for salvation, that they would make that decision today. I pray that today they would encounter Jesus in a way that radically transforms them from the inside. God, I pray for those who are already believers. I pray that the truth of your word tonight would overwhelm our thinking, that it would transform the way that we think and live and act, that we wouldn't just do all of the outward things that look Christian, but that we would also on the inside allow ourselves to let you make yourself at home. And God, may it be for your glory. We don't want any attention, honor, and praise for ourselves, for our churches. We want it for you, Jesus. And God, I ask that you would continue to use this church, that you would use our church in Cape Town for your honor and your glory. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we thank Blake one more time for being with us? Um, Yeah, it's a privilege to get to hear from him.
Uh, he is in the United States for a very limited time, so it's, it's an honor to get to have him here. Make sure you shake his hand on the way out. Um, a few quick things before you go. Uh, first and foremost, as Pastor Josh mentioned, every dollar that comes in here, uh, we take right off the top and give to, to families like the Hunters who are out there sharing the gospel with people that we'll never meet. Uh, we don't pass a basket here because we don't want to guilt anybody into giving, but if it's something you want to do, um, there are boxes in the back of the auditorium. You can head online to harborchurch.com uh, or text in if you want to be a part of that and be a part of supporting what Blake and Megan are doing over in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, and last but not least, if you are new here, make sure you swing by that new here desk on the way out. We have a gift for you. We just want to say hello and make a connection. Uh, we also have Bibles. If you find yourself in need of the Bible, if you're trying to go back to the well, but you don't have that physical piece, we've got one we'd love to give you for free. So make sure you do that. You guys are dismissed. We'll see you next week.